Welcome everybody. Another day, another webinar. I hope you're ready. At least I am. Uh, as you might know, I'm Dino Boat, sales engineer over here at Land Handling Technologies. And today I'm with my colleague, Floris Raamakers. Thank you. And he is uh, going to tell you some wonderful things about uh, Industry 4.0 and the future proving of your production. I will hand over the word right now to Floris. Cool. Thanks, Dino. Uh, yeah, as Dino said, I'm Flores. I'm a lead software engineer here at Land Handling. Well, we've been working together for a while. Yes. And uh, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, Industry 4.0 and how we, as Land Handling, uh, make sure we're future-proof. So without further ado, let's uh, let's go to the uh, the presentation. So Industry 4.0 has been a buzzword that's been going around, and we don't really know what it is, and there's no clear definition of what it is. Therefore, I'm so curious what you're going to tell us today, because I also don't know the contents so, yet. So yeah. I'm very eager to learn from you. I hope I'm going to clarify some things for you. So um, yeah, to start off with, I'm going to take you through a, a brief little history of the Industrial Revolution, because we're saying Industry 4.0, so it's actually the fourth Industrial Revolution that we're looking at. We're going to have a little chat about so what Industry 4.0 is, um, what challenges we're facing, who the mm -hmm. stakeholders are in Industry 4.0, what our vision is as land handling. You may know a little bit from your, from your sales mm -hmm. background. And then Great. how we're ensuring future-proof integration. Um, however, right. first, I'd actually like to ask you some questions. Okay, let's go. So if I throw these statements at you, having predictable uh, machine availability will do absolutely nothing for my production planning, or will it actually greatly improve my production planning? I would say uh, definitely greatly improve production planning. Okay, that's yeah. interesting. I, I agree with you on this one, yep. Okay, so it's not a wrong or a right answer. There's it's definitely just, no wrong okay. or right answers. It's just a matter of matter of opinion in this case. All right. So the second one, knowing what maintenance to do upfront would be an absolute game changer or would actually not matter at all. So let's say yeah. I know about a month in advance what I need to do to maintain the machine, what parts I need to fix, what needs to be changed out, if it needs new oil, etc. Would that change the game or would that not really do that much? Mm, I think it depends on the profile of the customer. But in general, from what I see, and have seen would be a game changer. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. And then the last one, having predictable operating costs would not improve our business that much, just kind of stay the same, or would it actually benefit our business knowing the costs up front? It can benefit, I think, in, in many different ways, not yeah. only financial, but also operational. Yeah. yeah, fully agree with you on this one. Yeah, so yeah, if we just go back a little bit, because as we said, it's the fourth industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. So we started back in the 1750s, roughly, started in the UK with the arrival of the steam engines. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly in the cotton industry. They had the spinning jennies, they had the nice big looms, and we saw that production capacity actually went up, and we saw that production cost came down. And this is kind of a trend that we're seeing, because now we'll move to Industry 2.0, so around 1870s, you can kind of skip in ahead 100 years. And this is where we kind of advanced a bit. We saw the rise of electricity, and we saw big production lines coming mm -hmm. into play, and we could make machines and cars more efficiently. So again, we saw production capacity going up, and we saw production costs coming down again. And then we kind of head to the modern day. They say from about 1970 to the 2000s. And to be pretty honest, it's pretty much, I reckon it's still going on. We're still in the 3.0 era. And this is where the rise of computers, programmable logic controllers, etc., kind of came up. So now we were actually automating these lines. And again, we saw production going up mm -hmm. and we saw production costs going down. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I also think some industries are already full in. 4.0, so to say, and some industries are still working on yeah. Industry 3.0. I, I, reckon, I reckon you have a very good case there. I think that some industries, uh, the automotive industry, for example, is a very, mm -hmm. good, uh, very good indicator of actually where 4.0 is already starting to take grip and actually starting to take over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Looking at the industry that we're in, so the, the kind of the food and beverage and the, the agricultural industry, I think we're still a little bit behind on that. I think we're just starting to accommodate the 4.0 mentality and what it can bring and what it will kind of give us in the future. And may accelerate. And will very likely accelerate based on the experience from the other, from the other industries. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you've probably heard this. And if you Google industry 4.0, you get all these flashy pictures and they promise you a better future and your kids will do better and you're more production and more efficient and you get things like cloud computing and vertical integration and yeah. autonomous systems big data iot you get all these 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 fancy terms and my belief is that without like the bigger picture attached yeah they're just they're just gimmicks they're just yeah. yes we can do vertical integration yes we can do cloud computing there's nothing combining them together no, i must i must say I've did it a couple of times in Google, 
industry 4.0. Yep. And for me, it felt like I ended up in a maze. Yeah. Of all these, um, yeah, say more or less hollow words. Yep. Uh, what does it mean? Does it make sense? How must I see this on a real production yep. floor, for example? Make it more, yeah, like a real picture. Like. Yeah. And that's pretty much what we're trying to figure out today between ourselves. Yeah, all right. If we're looking at the industrial revolutions, we can actually, actually kind of see a bit of a trend occurring. Mm -hmm. So as we said, we came from 1.0 to 2.0 to 3.0 to 4.0. And we saw pretty much the production capacity goes up and the production costs go down. We've been seeing this for a while. However, the third trend that we can kind of identify on the screen is actually the skills requirement. Yeah. So predating the industrial revolution, if I was a worker or you were a worker and you made pens, you just needed to know how to put together a pen. Yeah. And the more efficiently you could do this and the quicker you did this, at the end of the day, the more you got paid. Yeah. yeah. Skip forward a couple of years, now you're an operator at the line. And what do you have to do? You have to set up the line, yeah. you have to know how to clean it, you have to know how to solve some small problems on it, you have to know how to maintain it, you have to run quality checks. There's a whole load more that you need to do to be able to yeah. operate a line efficiently. That's great. And that actually leads us to pretty much the first challenge that we're actually facing in the modern industry, which is staff turnover. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a study by IBM's Business Institute saying that pretty much one in four members of staff yeah. will leave their employer in the production industry by the end of this year. That's quite a high number. <laughs> it, it's quite a high number. And it, it kind of comes from people that want job growth, people that want to they want a better pay, they want better salaries, they want to move closer to work or they want to work somewhere else. And you may remember this because we both started at LAN at some stage. Yeah. What happens the first couple of weeks you join a new company? Yeah, you're not to say you're not productive at all. You 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 get so many impressions. Exactly. You have to pretty much learn yeah. all the new processes. Exactly. Now imagine that in a production environment. You have to learn the sealing machines, you have to learn the labeling machines, you have to learn yeah. our equipment, hopefully. Yeah. Not that much though, because they're pretty intuitive. We like to think that they're very <laughs> intuitive, but still, yeah, it's, no. it's new information coming across at you. It's a complicated job, yeah. And now we're talking about production staff. If we move that across to an even more difficult area, which is technical staff, mm -hmm. which is yeah. stupidly difficult to get at the moment, yeah. the problem becomes even bigger because now they have to know internally how all these new machines in a factory work. So that's the first one, which is staff turnover and the kind of corresponding staff training. The second one, or big challenge that we're facing, is machine maintenance. We've just been through the COVID pandemic. Yeah. Uh, you got through it pretty well, I guess. It's yeah, yeah, luckily I, I am, yeah. Unscathed, we're both still here, this, uh, it's yeah. nice. Um, but it's probably not go unnoticed that the lead times during the COVID pandemic of electronic parts specifically. Yeah. But it, it, it's a, uh, yeah, you can, can say it nicely, but you could also say it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. Yeah. And at the moment, they're not prognosing it to become any better until probably the third quarter of next year before it kind of evens out. And then from those kind of things, I ask how much is that prognosis worth? To be, to be honest. Exactly. Because we made the same statement last year saying by the end of this year, we'll be fine. And yeah. Here we are again, we're looking at a year ahead. Um, you know, the market works, supply goes down, demand goes up. What happens with the price? Prices go up. Prices go up as well. So yeah. material costs are becoming very, very much a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, and nobody wants to pay for it. And nobody <laughs> wants it. to pay for it, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So if we now put two challenges together, which is technically trained staff, mm -hmm. high lead times on material costs, yeah. and you add a breakdown on Friday afternoon when everybody's just gone home, it, really, really quickly turns into a nightmare. Yeah, 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 that, that will be a, a tough one. It's a tough sure. one. I've had those calls in the past and it's usually, you need to come and fix my machine and this needs There's to happen today. There's a lot of today. emotion involved. There's uh, a lot of emotion mean. involved, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it also actually says something very quickly about the stakeholders. Because obviously if this happens on a Friday afternoon, most of the stakeholders within a company, they get a little bit distressed. But Looking at who those stakeholders are, and I'm just kind of compromising this because I know there's a lot mm -hmm. more stakeholders in the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can kind of see that generally in a production environment, there's a production department, quite yeah. logically. Um, there's a maintenance department that have to fix the machines when they're yeah. broken. 
there's a planning department that tells the production department, well, this is what the customer ordered, and this is what we need to do, and this is when it needs to be finished. And then there's a financial department that gets to pay the bill at the end of the day. Yeah. It's all fun and games. And usually they do not agree with a lot initially. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so we're looking at this Friday afternoon scenario and we have these stakeholders. Yeah. So a machine goes down on the line. First thing that happens is the operator on the line. He goes, well, this is, this is terrible. My machine's gone down. I can't produce. Yeah. He calls up the maintenance department saying then, well, my machine's broken. You need to fix my machine. Yeah. And I need to produce. So this needs to be fi fixed quite quickly. So the maintenance guy shows up. He's looking at the machine saying, well, I need this and this part. And obviously mm -hmm. it's the part that they don't have in stock. Yeah. They call the supplier. They're saying, well, everybody's just gone home for the weekend. You'll have to wait till Monday. By this time, the guy in the production has already called the planning department saying, everything will everything be, a mess. Will be yeah. a mess. We need to move production to a different production line. Yeah. And at the end of the day, the financial department's asking, why did we pay extra for parts? And why did we pay extra for people to come yeah. on Saturday? So if we look at the stake of these stakeholders, um, there's actually quite a lot of differences. Obviously, the main priority of a production department is production. Yeah. They want to produce. They need to have the staff on the line to produce it, and they want to get it done on time so they can have a bit of a weekend as well. Yeah. And preferably, let's say, 100% uptime. <laughs> preferably 100% uptime, absolutely. We'll, get to, we'll actually get to that in a bit. Okay. Um, the maintenance department, their stake is uptime. Yeah, they want the machine well. to be perfectly maintained and nice and shiny and working all day. Yeah, and at least with, I think, the least amount of, um, I think, work that they have to put in. Yep, yep. And easy accessibility, everything. Easy accessibility, easy to maintain, knowing yeah. what to do, exactly. The planning department, they're usually involved with the customer satisfaction. They get an order from their customer, they want mm -hmm. it delivered on time when they want it, so they don't have to yeah. tell the customer it's going to be late. Yeah. And then the financial department, well, what does the financial department want to do? They want to make sure that the numbers add up with the prognosis. Exactly. And preferably pay as least as possible. Yeah. Looking at Industry 4.0 and the stakeholders, it actually helps to look at the benefits mm -hmm. for each shareholder. Stakeholder, sorry. That um, doesn't matter. So if we look at a production department, you already kind of said it. What are they most benefited by? A production department is pretty much most benefited by a very high uptime yeah. or minimum downtime, whichever way you kind of mm -hmm. want to look at it. Yeah. They're also benefited by a maximum performance of the machine. And they're very much benefited by a minimum staff requirement and a maximum skills availability. Yeah. So preferably the machine telling them, this is what you need to do and this is how you need to do it. Yeah. And if there would go something wrong, that the machine tells them what went wrong and how they can fix it ASAP. Exactly. Do you remember the last time you had to grab the manual of a printer? Uh, luckily not. No, because the printer <laughs> tells you on the screen, open yeah. the cover, take yeah. out the paper, press close the, the cover, right. press reset, and that's yeah. all done. We're not quite there yet. No. Continuing to look at the benefits, uh, what, what every department's benefited by, um, the maintenance department, funnily enough, is also benefited by a minimum downtime. Because mm -hmm. it means they've done their job very well, and it means yeah. that the machines are running perfectly. However, they're also very much benefited by a maximum skills availability, having the yeah. right person to do the job. The planning department, funnily enough, is also benefited by... As much as possible uptime. Minimum downtime, maximum uptime. Yeah. Exactly, because yeah. they'll know what they can plan on the line, when it's going to be finished, when they can roll out new products, etc. Yeah. And then the financial department, well, yeah, minimum costs. Yeah, or as much as uh, pr predictable as possible. As predictable as possible, yeah. and at least the least as possible. Yeah. yeah. So what does that kind of mean? Well, it kind of goes to our vision of what Industry 4.0 can be and what I believe the problem is that we can solve, which is why the statement for land handling in this case is let's go full circle. Let's close all sense. the knowledge, knowledge gaps between these four stakeholders, mm -hmm. or these four main stakeholders within the company. If a production department goes down, why is it going down? Why didn't the maintenance department already know, well, this part was wearing out because it got a message up front from the machine saying, well, this motor's taking up more current. Yeah. My bearings have worn out. I need new oil. This cylinder's leaking. We need new more air that goes going to the machine. These are all measurable 
conditional yeah. factors. They can be fact based on facts. Yeah. And it can be based on condition monitoring and just facts that we're pumping across to these intelligent systems. Yeah. So that's pretty much our vision, to make sure that the manual task of communicating from the production department to a maintenance department to a planning department and to a financial department kind of disappears. There's no need for it. The financial department should, in a very close future, be able to know this is what my machine is going to cost mm -hmm. over the next year in terms of electricity, in terms of pneumatics, in terms of parts, in terms yeah. of maintenance that needed by external parties, etc. Yeah. And labor. And labor, absolutely. Yeah. The planning department, we'd like them to know up front, well, actually, the machine is only available for 75% today because the other 25%, we need to maintain the machine yeah. because this can be planned and it becomes yeah. more planable. And the production also knows, okay, the output is lower today, so exactly. this is how much we can plan. Yeah, and they can play with their targets for a week to still match up to customer demand yeah. by the end of the week. And the maintenance department, the same thing goes, because they'll get an upfront message saying, well, actually, these parts need to be changed out. Mm -hmm. Dino doesn't know how to do it. Or sorry, let's say <laughs> Floris doesn't know how to do this. Oh, but I, I don't know either. <laughs> and we call Dino, because Dino has to fix the problem, because he has the specific skill set to do yeah. it. So even your skills requirements become less, because you don't have two people having to do one task. Now we need the specialist to do the task, and he, he becomes planable, yeah. or she becomes planable. Yeah. So how do we as land handling ensure that we have a future-proof solution? Well, it's actually quite simple, because these solutions, they're already out there. There's certain industry standards that we can use and we can exploit yeah. to kind of make this future-proof and make sure it stays future-proof. And these are things like OPC UA. This is a predefined set of uh, communication that we can use to kind of bridge the gap between the OT and the mm -hmm. IT worlds. So would it be, eh, some of us know a bit more about the technology than others? Yeah. You mentioned OPC UA. Yep. I've heard the term more often. Yep. Is that sort of the English of machine language? Can we look a bit like this? Because everybody knows English. Or yeah, if, if, we, if we boil it down very basically, it's a predefined set of, okay, this is how we communicate in a, mm -hmm. in a general sense. So yeah, you can, you can call it a type of English within the, the communication protocols. Yeah. All right. Um, being between the IT and OT world mm -hmm. bridge. Yeah. The other way we ensure that we kind of make ourselves future-proof is by looking at uh, utilizing standards. There's yeah. a few standards within the OPC UA world where the OT and the IT worlds matches up. Um, the automotive industry uses quite a lot of these. Um, and these were kind of digging through to see, okay, well, we don't need to invent the wheel twice. There have been smarter people that have done this for us. Let's piggyback off those and take all the nice things that are already there. And I think for the future, and, and also for Industry 4.0, and specif specifically for this type of things, use the specialists yes. because they have done their research, they have put hours and hours, days, years into yeah, getting a grip on yep. this little piece of subject, so use them. Use them, exactly, yeah. use them. And then the last one that we're kind of going into is that we're working in that way to define a base layer for our equipment portfolio. Mm -hmm. The base layer, first of all, there's a, there's, a very, there's a very old quote by Sir Francis Bacon saying, knowledge is power. So yeah. The first thing yeah. we need is knowledge about the machine. And what knowledge is already there? Well, we already know stuff about the machine. We know what the machine status is, if it's running, if it's stopped, if it's in an error, if mm -hmm. it's in an error, what error there is. Um, so we kind of have an understanding of what the machine wants and needs. Mm -hmm. We have information about what batch it's running, what program it's running, what mm -hmm. data it's receiving from either an MES or an ERP system. Yeah. Um, we have information about the production, how many packs are coming across, yeah. how many are being rejected, how many are yeah. being accepted, how many crates are going through, are they fully, are they completely filled, are they underfilled, are they overfilled, yeah. etc. There's quite a lot of information we already know and we kind of have centralized in our own PLCs. Yeah. And you were talking ERP and MAS systems? Yep. Before, eh, over here in handling, are our machines already ready to integrate with this? Yes, we, there is, uh, at the moment we're still working on a very custom customer-based uh, basis. Mm -hmm. So the customer says, well, I have this MES system or this ERP system or whatever kind of system we need to integrate with. Um, and at the moment it's still very much a custom solution, yeah. which we're more than happy to do, but at the end of the day it's very cost inefficient. Yeah. Because we're making something specifically for that customer yeah. that can be used by that customer and that customer alone. It's not 
can't copy it across that easily to other yeah. customers. So what we're proposing is just making a base layer, having yeah. a basic set of these are the data points that we provide yeah. by default, and then we can add on top of them. So the yeah. default layer becomes broadly yeah. accepted. And from what we know, and from our experience, which is quite a lot, yeah. uh, these are the most valuable and the most basic valuable in pieces of information we can give to you. They may not be directly the most valuable ones there. Mm -hmm. They're okay. just the easiest ones to get across first. Okay, yeah. And it just provides a start to say, okay, this is where yeah. we can start measuring. And then knowledge over time becomes power. Yeah, yeah, because I think and that's something, um, yeah, what, what my feeling is. Yeah. Uh, hey, of course, I also, from my uh, position here, get a lot of questions about data and we want yeah. to know more about the machines. And well, what I see, usually people want, want to go from zero to being the hero. Absolutely. In, in the least amount of time. But I yeah. think these are processes that take up a lot of time. And it's also a learning curve for the user. So therefore, I think it's the best way. Also, my, my opinion from, from sales point of view, start with those simple pieces of data yep. and start doing something with them. Get a feeling with them and get a grip on how you can deploy it yep. to gain some interesting well, knowledge. It's interesting you say it from, from, from zero to hero in one step. Um, it's actually one of our female colleagues that actually pointed all the, to the, all the male colleagues and said, well, all you guys want to go from, from zero to hero within a day, mm -hmm. like this. And she kind of made us see, like, there's no way to go from zero to hero. Let's take a very small step, mm -hmm. take another small step, take another small step. So the first step is, let's push out the data that we already have and that we can already provide yeah. to the external world and then build upon that. Because industry 4.0, we're not going to get to industry 4.0 overnight. This is no. going to be a, pr a prolonged process. So yeah, th the first step for us is just pushing out the data that we already know and that we already have. Stuff mm -hmm. like what we just discussed, machine status, program information, batch information. But also the more condition-based monitoring stuff. How much current is a motor drawing? Yeah. How much air is a certain section of the machine or even an individual cylinder using? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of runtime are we getting out of the system? Yeah. And these are all information pieces that we can just present to the outside world. Yeah. And we briefly discussed the barrier between OT and IT. Yeah. Now, as land, land handling, we're an OT-based company. Yeah. We build machines, we make sure that the machines work. Our, our core business isn't the IT. Oh, that's correct. Hence why we're trying to utilize OPC UA as much as possible to kind of bridge that gap and make sure that information is available to the IT companies yeah. um, and the chain partners that we do work with. Um, to make sure the data is available and they can actually do stuff with the data that makes it useful for our end customers. Yeah, yeah. So that's pretty much where we're going at the moment and that's how we're ensuring that we're future-proofing ourselves and continuing to future-proof ourselves. This kind of goes in the philosophy of an ancient African proverb. Uh, as land handling, we don't want to go alone. I think we can do it alone. We can do it alone. Oh. We would be more than capable to make a fancy picture with images and trend data, et cetera, mm -hmm. and have nobody want it, which is the second step in future-proofing ourselves, which is working together with end customers that we're already doing at the moment, yeah. chain partners and IT companies to yeah. go far and go together. Yeah, and I think go slower as well. And take the steps that we step need. Step by step. And yeah. I think, and, and maybe we didn't say it that clear, but I think step one is start collecting data. Let's start collecting data because first. You need quite a bunch before it comes that valuable that you can profit or gain information from it. Absolutely. Because from two hours of measurement from current from your drive. It's just going to stay the same. It, it will not tell you anything about no. when it needs. It's going to be measuring data, comparing data over time, and actually com cross comparing data between potentially two or multiple yeah. the same machines, similar yeah. machines. We are able to provide all the data. And I think, as we mentioned, that's step one. Yeah. So now we enable our clients to also store that data. Yeah. And then over time, as soon as they have some data, we can help them to structure that data, combine it, and then we can go to the next step together. Take the next step together. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much for this one. Thank you for having me. It was uh, very interesting, very valuable information for uh, 
a lot of our, our clients and I think a lot of other people from the, from the industry that yeah, they can also watch uh, this webinar. I would like to end with, if you have any questions after uh, looking at this webinar, uh, we have a comment session, section, as you might have seen on the screen. Please, any questions, type them over there, send them to us. Some, some one of us is there right now and uh, can answer your questions right away. If they are uh, too complicated for now, we'll be happy to, to schedule another, uh, maybe, uh, or a digital session or a session together over here in our office and discuss this uh, in a wider committee. And maybe Flores can join in as well. Happy to. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Flores. Thanks, Dino.